Normally, my Morrowind challenges make an exception for using Sunder and Keening on the Heart of Lurkin, but there are some clever ways of getting around this. Not long after I started my Thieves Guild pacifist video, YouTube dropped into my recommended videos a restoration-only challenge by Mayrun's Mike. A good watch, if I do say so myself. I'd say to check out his other videos, but as of right now, he's only got the one. I am looking forward to more, however. The idea is to use companions and merchants to kill everything. A companion can help you with the Ash Vampires, and merchants can be used to attack the heart with Sunder and Keening. What I wanted to do was my own pacifist run, but I didn't want to have to escort a bunch of NPCs up Red Mountain. I hate escorting NPCs, and if Mayrun's Mike's video is anything to go by, escorting NPCs up Red Mountain is... is rough. There is another option, however. I learned something rather neat about the Heart of Lorcan recently, and I believe it'll allow me to beat the game without wielding any weapons, doing no damage myself, and without having to escort more than a single NPC up the mountain. We'll be relying on command spells. Naturally, we're the Puppet Master. Look at this diagram of the human hand. We're all just puppets with internal strings. We won't be doing a lot of leveling this run, so we want to build this character in a way that starts us off with a lot of magicka and high levels in illusion, conjuration, and restoration. Acrobatics and athletics are there too for mobility. Since we want a lot of magicka, we're obviously going to be a high elf, so we get the extra magicka, and we're going to take the mage sign. Atronach would be more magicka, but then we'd need more potions. Gold and spells. That's what we need. The simplest gold comes from selling the junk in the Mage's Guild supply chests. While we're in Sage with Mora's Guild Hall, we'll buy Frenzying Touch from Uleni Halaren and spell make a different version a little later when gold isn't so tight. Initially, I was expecting to not use Creeper for easy gold, but later in the run, I'll realize this restriction is pointless since the run itself is a bit dumb to begin with. Creeper's cheesy, but this run is cheesy. But until we get to that part of the footage, we'll rely on Nelkarya. Sell some potions and steal her alchemy tools. As a high elf with a mage birth sign, and soon an overpowered piece of gear, Magicka isn't really a bottleneck. So instead of relying on enchanted items for teleports, we'll just buy Elm Civi Intervention Recall and Mark from the basement wizards in the Belmora Temple. We'll get Divine Intervention the next time we return to Sajith Mara. I forgot the first time. Ajira will buy some of those alchemy tools we stole, and we can use the gold to buy a few more spells from around the guild. Moraine Dren, huh, you think he's related to Orvis Dren? Well, he sells on Ducey's open door, which we'll need once for the whole run. We'll grab Levitate as well. Slowfall will come in handy, and not just where you'd expect. Well, both instances involve not dying to falling damage, but the more obvious is the current flight is one of the reasons. The other isn't a given, but I mean, it probably is. If you levitate to Red Mountain, you wouldn't think you'd need this, but I think the only way to get into Red Mountain is by falling in and you need slow fall. It doesn't matter. Ariel Fiancel sells it. The version you buy is excessive since you only need one point of slow fall to negate falling damage, so we'll spell make a weaker version a bit later. We're, we're going to be saving a lot of the spell making for later. Both the Command Humanoid and Command Creature spells are sold by Felon Marion in Tel Brunor, and they cost nearly 2,000 gold each. Yeah, that's a problem. I'm gonna need lots of easy gold if I want to get this run rolling. We'll place a mark here and return a bit later. For now, let's get that overpowered item I mentioned earlier. You know, I probably should have done this the first time I was here, but I didn't think of it at the time. We're back in Sedanine, and we're gonna buy a few scrolls from the secret scroll vendor just outside the town. Pleasure doing business with you. The path to Cull is a short one, and the walk to the dock is even shorter. But the journey from Fort Frostmoth's port to the Skull Village is long, or it would be. If we empty our inventory of needless junk and point ourselves in the right direction, we should be able to land in the village in a single leap. Fingers crossed the slow fall spell doesn't fail. Excellent. Lasner here is sad because his son is missing or dead or hanging out with a bunch of skeletons at the bottom of a well. He gives us a key to the well out back, so he's probably got some suspicions regarding his son's whereabouts. If you don't pick up this quest first, you wouldn't be able to so easily emerge from the well waters into this cave and nonchalantly bypass all the aggressive skeletons. Having this quest gives you the option to convince Timval to hand over the Mantle of Woe without combat. If combat were involved, emerging from the waters and ignoring all the skeletons wouldn't have been a good idea. You'd want to kill them all. After telling Timval that his dad loves him, the excitement is just too overwhelming, and he strips down to his skivvies and hands over the Mantle of Woe. It fortifies our conjuration by 50 points and grants five times our intelligence as Magicka. Perfect for this run. We just can't wear it in the sun or else we take 20 points of damage every second. Budget Vampirism. This next item's been mentioned in the comments several times at this point, and I'm finally gonna get it. On the northeastern side of Balmora, near Caius Cassades' love shack, is a guard tower. And within that guard tower is a guard guarding a bed, or so it seems. Atop the wardrobe is a sword. 
a powerful sword, an expensive sword, the Sword of White Woe. It's an ebony long blade with an underwhelming drain health enchantment on it, but most importantly, it's worth 17k. If you turn the guard away and hide behind this pillar, you can jump and swipe the sword without him noticing. Writing this script right now, well, reading this script that I wrote, well, I wrote it when, I'm now remembering that you can open your inventory and loot items out of the world that way. So my efforts to frame perfectly grab the sword was unnecessary. If you jump, open your inventory, you kind of freeze the world and you can just grab the item. It was at this point I decided to start selling stuff to Creeper. There is the Zynab merchant who has a lot of gold, and there's also the Mud Crab merchant east of Vivek, but Creeper is the easiest to get to. There is also some Orcish armor in Gorak Manor that sells for a decent price, and it'll make doing the Creeper shuffle a bit easier. Since the creature merchants buy and sell items at value, you can swap items back and forth between Creeper and yourself to get the maximum amount of profit. Sell him several items valued less than 5k, wait a day for his gold to replenish, then sell him an item worth more than 5,000 gold while buying the items you just sold. Wait again, and then you could sell the items you just bought back, back to him. That way you maximize your gold. Now that we're stacked with gold, we can buy those command spells from Felon. These will be the crux of the run. You might know where I'm going with this, but I think it might still surprise you. I'll be spellmaking several different varieties of command spells. We may have a girthy magicka pool with the Mantle of Woe equipped, but we still need to balance cost and utility. First, we'll make a command humanoid spell. 10 points for 10 seconds. It costs 82 points of magicka to cast, but guarantees any level 10 or lower humanoid will act as a companion for 10 seconds. We'll also make another command humanoid spell 6 points for 20 seconds. It seemed like a good idea at the time, because of how I thought the escorting portion of this run would work, but I actually ended up not needing it. It's not really a big deal. If you've watched Mayrun's Mike's video, and again, you should, you might understand why I'm making a command creature 1 point for 30 seconds. You might know what I'm going to use it on, but I still think you'll find the final result odd. Before we leave, I'm going to steal Felon shit. I learned in my last video that this shelf behaves as a solid wall for sneak purposes. Felon can't detect me behind this shelf, but I can loot everything on the shelf with impunity. The staff should sell for a bit. Now that gold is less of an issue, the prospect of enchanting some jewelry is appealing to me. That was a stupid sentence, why did I write it like that? Now that gold is less of an issue, I can actually enchant some jewelry. We could do some sneak shenanigans. That was the hardest thing for me to say. You have no idea how many times I had to try to say some sneak shenanigans. So we turn her away, stand behind the pillar, you know, do all that jazz. But we've got a command humanoid spell. She's only level 7, so if we command her with the level 10 spell I made, we can lead her down the stairs, far enough away from her desk, so we can just pocket the soul gems before she wanders back. Yeah, I probably could have gone a telekinesis spell or something, but uh, that's... It's, we're a puppet master. We got it, we got it, we got it, we got it, we... we, we yeah. <laughs> How do words work? Because these are stolen from the Mage's Guild, this means we can't use the Mage's Guild enchanters to enchant the items I want enchanted. So we're gonna have to go to a different enchanter. Oh, I just, I, I realized I lied earlier. We'll need to use the unlock spell more than once, twice. We want to get into the Hollow Manor and take the extravagant necklace off of Rowland's corpse. It has a decent enchanting capacity and should be enough for whatever I plan on using these gems for. I'm not exactly sure what I want to do with the soul gems though, but at least we have all the stuff we need when I do decide what I want. Right now, what I do want to do is assault some vampire citadels. Before coming here, I bought an invisibility spell in Aldron, and I made a command humanoid 35 points for one second. Dagoth Ur is level 35, and I need some way of getting him into combat that doesn't require me attacking him. I'm not sure what will work and what won't work, but this might help. I have no idea. It might seem like I had a plan before I set out on this run, but I'm kind of I'm kind of winging it. I wasn't actually sure this was going to work at all, but the fact that you're seeing this video means it did. So, hooray. Let's get a hold of Sunner and Keening before we worry about Dagoth Ur. Keening is easy. It's in Odrasal behind a level 20 locked door. You can just unlock the door. You could kill Dagoth Odros for the key, but, I mean, why bother? We will need to kill Dagoth Vemin for Sunder, however. Before running off to Veminal and hoping for the best, I figure we might as well try pitting the Golden Saint in Uldrasol against Odros just to see how it fares, experiment, see what works and what doesn't. By commanding either Odros or the Saint, I can get the two into combat with each other, and even when the command effect wears off, the two should still be fighting. The invisibility spell might help divert attention away from me and to the commanded NPC, so let's try it. These aren't humanoids, are they? 
Could have fooled me. All right, we'll leave a mark here and I'm civvy back to Outrun. We can make a bunch of command creature spells in the temple. We want one for Dagoth Ur. If he's like the Ash Vampires, then he's also a creature and not a humanoid. 35 points for one second. And you know, now that I think about it, this actually kind of goes to prove that Dagoth Ur isn't actually the same person as Vorin Dagoth was. He's a creation of the heart. He's not an immortal version of somebody who used to be. He's just a manifestation of like the last thing the heart remembers or something. He's not a humanoid. He's a creature. He's a thing. Ugh. We'll make another one for the weaker creatures in the Citadel. 17 points for five seconds. Should be good enough to command the squid face guys, or at least the noodle snoots. If not, I might be able to find a workaround with the shorter duration spells. Time to test them. Back to Odrasol. We command the golden saint. She becomes friendly for a moment, aggros Odros, and... That doesn't bode well. It seems Odros is going after the saint, and the saint is going after me. But if I cast invisibility... Ah. So it works in theory. Execution might be tough since Odros just executed the Golden Saint, but that was just a trial run. There are more enemies to work with in Veminal rather than just a single Golden Saint, and we don't have to kill Odros. Vemin is the only Ash Vampire we have to kill. Wait, no, no, not kill. Manipulate events so he dies. Speak freely, sir. Yeah, I could just cast Levitate or drink a Bargain Rising Force Potion, but then I'd be crawling through this guy. And I'm obviously going to draw the attention of a few Cliff Racers. I probably wouldn't die to them, but it would still be annoying. One or two Cliff Racers, I could handle that. Probably could handle three. Any more than that would be absurd. There's not going to be more than that. Surely. Veminal. I'm trying to remember what enemies are in here, and which ones would be the best to use to fight Dagoth Vemin. I know there's a Bonewalker, maybe two, Ash Ghouls, of course, a Dramora somewhere near the end, and a named Skeleton. Do Skeletons count as creatures, or are they undead? Are undead creatures? I mean, technically they would be, but do they count as that in the game? Hmm. There's probably a Noodle Snoot somewhere in here as well. Oh yeah, there's this squid face bozo. Might be able to use him to fight Vemin. Their magic attacks do make them tough to kite though. As much as I'd love to have one throwing poison clouds and fireballs at Vemin, I doubt I'd be able to dodge all its casts before leading it to the end of the dungeon. So we'll, we'll skip it for now. I'll just run away. Hopefully he forgets about me. Oh, there's a noodle snoot right here, just outside Vemin's room. That's handy. We'll lure the Noodle Snoot to Vemin, then command Vemin to get the two to fight. And now, we just wait to see who wins. I expect it'll be Vemin. Yep. But that's fine because this dungeon is full of potential puppets. Where'd that Dramora run off to? Ah, there you are. All right, this is gonna be tough. Hello? Anyone here? Oh shit, Squid Man. How'd he get down here so quick? Did he vibrate through the ceiling? Better idea. Lead Vemin to the Dramara since Vemin doesn't have a stupidly strong fireball spell. If I can get them next to each other, that should make it easier to force the two into combat. And if I dodge enough fireballs, the Dramara should run out of Magicka. Command the Dramara. Excellent. Oh, skeleton's here. Well, that was quicker than expected. Nice going, demon from another plane of existence. I'll be taking the spoils, if you don't mind. I'm sure Creeper will love that amulet, too. I'll be leaving Sunder and Keening near Balmora's guild guide. They're heavy and will just weigh me down, and this is the perfect spot for them anyway. We'll want them here when the time comes. What could that possibly mean? Before heading back to the mountain, we'll stock up on some exclusive Magicka and health potions at Nalkaria's shop. They're expensive, but money's no question. Still a good idea to raise her disposition, though. Discounts are nice. Alright, I finally decided what I want to do with those soul gems. A heal other enchantment. Five points for ten seconds. The cost is low, so I'll be able to cast it several times before it runs out of charge. Five points per second should be enough, right? Why would a god be able to do more than 5 damage per second? Any more than that would be... absurd. 
I think a weak levitate spell could come in handy as well. One point of levitation can be really slow unless you have ludicrous amounts of speed. Casting it on enemies is like a poor man's paralysis, and because it's low magnitude, you can give it a long duration without much penalty. I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it, you know how it is. Now to deal with Dagoth Ur. Basically, we want to clear out the dungeon and kill Dagoth Ur's first form so we can unlock the heart chamber. I don't think any of his minions will be strong enough to kill him though, but the corridors just outside his room have pits of lava in them. Maybe I could use those. Because I'll have to escort an NPC through Dagoth Ur and all the way to the heart chamber, I figure it'd be in my best interest to clear out the dungeon of all the dangerous enemies first. Force them all to fight each other to the death and just make, make the run through for the NPC easier. In retrospect, I shouldn't have done this. Were I to do this run again, I'd just run through the dungeon like normal and use the enemies leading up to Dagoth Ur to kill Dagoth Ur, swapping them out with new enemies each time one died. Battle of Attrition. At the time, my mind was still set on dropping Dagoth Ur into the lava because that would be kind of funny. It's not going to work out that way. Well, it seems my robes can't outheal some of the damage. Should have expected that, honestly. You may be looking at this and wondering why it's a robe instead of the amulet that I picked up earlier. It was mostly because of the cost of the enchantment. I didn't want to spend all my gold on one enchantment. It doesn't matter. This thing sucks. The robes can't outheal the damage. I mean, five points every second? That's, it, that's terrible. We're going to make a healing spell later. One that I actually cast myself. I know there's a bone walker in the hallway after this squid, so if we get him to use up all his magicka, it should be easier to make those two fight. I don't need the bone walker damaging my strength when I'm escorting an NPC down here. Now fight, minions! Fantastic. Dagoth Ur welcomes you, Nerevar, my old friend. But to this place where destiny is made, why have you come to Jeez, the Dark Brotherhood is ambitious. I wonder. Oh, that was a one-sided fight. And Ur goes back to being passive. How do I get him to attack me? Oh my god, I didn't have the mantle of woe equipped this entire time. No wonder why I kept failing to cast my spells. God damn it. Ideally, I'd command this Ash Vampire and lead him into Dagoth's room and have the two fight in there, but with the Noodle Snoot, Bone Lord, and Vampire being in such close proximity to each other, commanding one of them will just result in it engaging the others in combat. Maybe I should have brought a Calm spell. That might have been smart. Oh well. We'll just have these three fight and use the winner as a weapon. I expect it'll be the Vampire who comes out on top. Yeah, of course, it's... Of course, it's the Noodle Snoot that survives. Pretty sure they're the weakest. Well, gotta play the hand I'm dealt. Come on, friend. Ah, oh, shit on my face. Now what? Guess I'll have to try the Lava Strat. A Frenzy creature spelled 35 points for 2 seconds. Once an enemy enters combat, even if the Frenzy effect wears off, they'll still be aggressive. Daddy Ur is level 35, so I'm guessing this will work. It's two seconds because some spell effects can be weird if they only last a single second. That might just be the case with Fortify buffs, come to think of it, but I don't know. As an aside, this isn't how Frenzy works. I assumed it was like Command, where the points corresponded to level. It works differently. NPCs have an aggression value, pretty much. They won't attack unless their aggression value exceeds a certain amount. That amount is different for different NPCs, affected by things like disposition or enemy type. Frenzy increases the aggression value of an NPC. And if the spell doesn't push their aggression value above a certain magic number, whatever that happens to be, they won't attack. Level has nothing to do with it, or has very little to do with it. I didn't realize that until after the run. Frenzy creature 100 points would have gotten Dagothur to attack. However, that didn't end up mattering anyway. Y you'll see why. So this Frenzy spell won't work. Punching him does get him aggressive. Fair. But I'm trying to do this without actually attacking anyone. Oh, this is interesting. I can command him and have him creep ever so slowly toward the door. But sometimes he tries to walk back to his original spot. Ugh, this is gonna take a minute. Now to lead him to the lava. 
Oh, why is it so far away? Don't laugh at me. I think a longer duration command spell might help here. Two seconds could be enough to sort of break him out of the reset loop, maybe? I have no reason to suspect that. I'm just grasping at straws. He's too tall. He, he won't fit. All right, so we're gonna have to go back to plan A getting his minions to kill him. Thankfully, there are still some squid-faced fellows roaming around the halls, so we'll use them. I don't know how they'll fare against Dagothar in a 1v1, but surely several should be sufficient. I'll need to deplete their magic up first, methinks. Listen, I'm already cheesing the hell out of this game. Dodging the magic by loading into a new cell is pretty mild. It's like escorting a grandma. Okay, let's see who wins. Damn it all. <sighs> Come on, friend. Boss wants to see you. The big problem is that Dagoth Ur heals over time. Resting to restore my magicka causes him to restore his health, so I need to be cautious of that. Okay, fight number two. I'll actually try healing the sleeper this time around. Man, these robes suck. Here's an idea. Let's leave. We're going to make a better restore health spell, like I mentioned earlier. 10 to 20 points for 10 seconds. Could that work? Well, it better because I'm pretty sure there's only one more sleeper in the dungeon atop one of those towers. And if he can't do it, I don't know what we're going to do. Maybe get some other minion from outside, grab a cliff racer. I have no idea. Let's just hope this works. We'll need to quickly run in and command him, then zip back to the door so he comes through with us to the next cell. Now we have to deplete his magicka. All right, he's spent. It'd be nice if there were a touch faster. See, that's the trouble with touch spells. You gotta get close so the heal makes contact, but if you get too close, you get one shot. This area is too cramped. Let's bring Dagothar back into his lair and have them fight in there. Okay, now we just have to hope the sleeper survives long enough to finish off Ur. My heals ain't great, and the sleeper's damage is pretty terrible, but what do you expect when a tank tries DPSing? And I'm definitely not healing spec, so this is just a mess. It's a ton of RNG, really. Ah, yes. Dagoth Irvin, you did it. Irvin? Name's Irvin? That's such a normal name. Uh, whatever. Now we need to deal with Dagoth Ur's second form, the immortal version. It'll be easier. What a fool you are. I'm a god. How can you kill a god? What a grand and intoxicating innocence. How could you be so naive? There is no escape. No recall or intervention can work in this place. Come. There's a way to get him to fall off the platform and land in the lava below. I'm pretty sure this doesn't kill him, but it takes him out of the fight. Merun's Mike referred to this as some kind of Genjutsu. I don't know what that means, but I assume it's some Naruto thing only anime nerds would understand. Dig off. That's not the end of it, though. Once we approach the heart, he respawns on the bridge. So we need to do this a second time. Only then will this room be safe. The easiest thing to do would be to levitate back to the top near the entrance of the room, and then wait for Dagothur to run back up the ramp. The problem is my levitate spell and levitate potions make me really slow, and dodging Dagoth's fireballs would probably be impossible at such low speeds. And those fireballs will kill us in one hit, so we gotta take the long way back so I can actually dodge the attacks. I've never actually walked over here before. I always just jumped over the edge onto the bridge, and then levitated my way back up after dealing with the heart. Apparently, there are some dreamers hanging out over here amongst the rubble. Go figure. I'll just command them so they break themselves upon Dagothar's body. Yeah, goodbye, Jojo. 
Now the room's safe. We can bring an NPC here, but not one you might expect. No recall or intervention can work in this place. The typical strategy is to escort two merchants to the heart chamber after you've sold one Sunder and the other Keening. You do some command aggression shenanigans with the heart and have them destroy it for you. But I'm not doing that. I'm only going to bring one NPC to the chamber, and it's not one that can buy anything. It's really silly how this works. So commanded individuals follow you through doors. That much is obvious at this point. But they can't follow you through teleports such as Omsivia Intervention, Divine Intervention, or Recall. Companions don't come with you when you do that. However, they will follow you on taxi services, boats, silt striders, and guild guides. Hmm. To prepare for this journey, let's stock up on more potions at Nalkaria's shop. A few dozen Magicka potions should do the trick. Now. In Caldera is the lowest level guild guide. Really, it doesn't matter what her level is. At first, I thought I'd have to cast command on her over and over again, but I ended up, you know, I'll, I'll explain when we get there. Anyway, if we command her and then have her teleport us to Outrun, she'll come with us. If we do command her over and over again, she will follow us wherever we go. But when the effect wears off, she'll start wandering back to her original position. We don't want this. Also, if we get attacked, she gets stuck in combat with whatever wildlife is coming after us. There'll be a couple cliff racers here and there, just about, so we don't want that either. Instead, we can taunt her until she attacks us, and as long as we stay within range of her, she should never drop aggro. Unless we use Command Humanoid on her. Then we can use her services again like nothing happened. So, she's gonna chase us all the way up Red Mountain. Not as trivial as you might think. Getting to Dagoth on foot isn't all that straightforward. We go through the Ghost Gate and follow the path north, accumulating quite the following of cliff racers. Maybe you should follow me too. I'm also planning on streaming some Daggerfall Unity on Twitch in the near future. First real playthrough, actually. I think it'll be fun. Daggerfall vets can laugh at my confusion, and everyone else can marvel at the archaic game without actually having to learn how to play it. I'll be streaming on time and date. Come hang out. Seamless plug aside, we need to take the long way around the mountain because neither I nor Amelia, her name is Amelia, can scale the steep cliffside. If only there were a climbing skill in the game. Imagine that, an Elder Scrolls game with a climbing skill. Next, you're going to tell me there's a running and swimming skill. Pfft, weird. On the map, it looks like you could just take this path. But the easiest footpath, I think, is this one. It lets you get to the crater of Red Mountain, or Mouth, or whatever the opening at the top of a volcano was called. Vent. The vent. I think it's the vent. Anyway, we need to take this roundabout path and drop into the vent. NPCs seem to be immune to fall damage. They sort of glide down slopes. So Amelia should be fine. We'll see. I wanted to acknowledge the supportive reaction I got from the sponsor of my last video. It being a book series certainly took a lot of people by surprise, and it's a book series that I really enjoy, so I'm glad I was able to do it. I'd love to do similar sponsorships in the future, but sponsorships like that are few and far between. There's a reason why you don't see a lot of them. So regarding other sponsorships, I'm a bit conflicted. On the one hand, I don't want to take any old sponsorship because I don't want to feign excitement for a product that I don't care about. On the other hand, YouTube can't skim any of the payment I get from the sponsors. YouTube takes about 50 to 70% of what the advertisers pay them. What the sponsors pay, YouTube can't touch. I really respect how Josh Strife Hayes approaches sponsorships, but his audience is large enough that he doesn't need to take sponsorships to continue to make a living from his content. So I'm not sure how I want to handle this going forward. What I can say is that there will be no sponsorship on this channel that I don't put a ton of consideration into first. I'm not an actor playing a role. If I advertise a product or a service, it's me advertising it, not some character I can distance myself from. Whatever I do decide to do, know that I'm not gonna lie. I've already refused a couple offers because I just didn't feel comfortable taking them. Like RGB gamer caffeine pill nonsense. And I won't be taking raid sponsorships either. That game is gross. What the hell's happening? Amelia. It's not... The cliff racers aren't interested in you. Why are you running? What? <sighs> oh, this works. Have her run away in the correct direction. I guess NPCs don't do bridges too good. I'm diseased, I'm over-encumbered, and exhausted from this trip up the mountain. I skipped a lot of the struggle, but this easily took like 20 minutes of constantly evading cliff racers, rats, and scamps. I have no idea how Mayroon's Mike did this more than once. It sucks. I probably should have brought cure disease potions, or cure disease spells. Whatever, I'm gonna have to ditch a bunch of my inventory. Ooh, Jesus, that's, that's a lot that's a lot of cliff races. And here's another difficult part. I need to open the door to the dungeon, make it to the entrance before the outer door opens fully, and command Amelia so she follows me into the dungeon. That's easier said than done, especially when you've got a dozen cliff racers pecking at your butt. Ah, damn it.
Man, that was rough. But we have some breathing room now. Let's bring Amelia to the heart chamber. Some corpus stalkers respawn, but they're easy to avoid. Amelia, just run around it. Oh, right, the sleeper's still here. Okay, so having her commanded when we enter this room is probably not a good idea. We'll drain its magicka with door cheese and then hopefully avoid combat with it while running past with Amelia. Great. Into the heart chamber we go. It's all been leading up to this. Check it out. We lead Amelia to the heart, command the heart with our level 1 command spell. See how it turns? It's our companion now. Then we command Amelia. Raise her disposition just a touch, and travel to Balmora. Yes, guild guides can teleport you no matter where they are. And the heart of Lorcan comes with us. It's really stupid. Let's cure these diseases in Balmora's temple first, then grab two merchants. Thorak, proprietor of the Razor Hole, we'll drop him off in the Mage's Guild, and Meldor, the armorer just across the street from the guild. It doesn't matter what merchants you get, but these two are close enough, so I just, I just grab them. We can sell Thorak Sunder, and Meldor Keening, so that when they enter combat, they'll start swinging the ancient Dwemer tools instead of whatever weapons they normally use. But NPCs don't take mortal damage from Sunder and Keening, so they don't need Wraithguard. First, we aggro Thorak by taunting him. Failing to pick his pocket might also work, but I wasn't sure if other NPCs in the area would get mad at me, so this is just as good. I will bathe in your blood. Then we command the heart, and Thorak immediately attacks it, striking the heart with Sunder. We'll do the same with Meldor. Taunt him to attack, run to the heart, command the heart, and... Kagernax enchantments? Gone. But what about a Kolokan? Well, if we return to the heart chamber, where I should have left a mark, but didn't. Oh, <laughs> the cliff racers are still here. Oh, how considerate. A Kolokan waited until we got back before it fell apart. Yeah, Zora, I fulfilled the prophecy. It was I who saved the world. Not Thorak, and not Meldor. No, it was me. Let's bring Amelia back to Caldera. Oh, this is too I easy. I hope this won't take long. Easily.